so and to kickstart, we have the man managing of hypertension comprehensively. And to do that, we have Dr. Musa Maya Issa, who is a cardiologist at the Pretoria Heart Hospital. Who is Musa Maya Issa? He's got a MSHB from Medunsa, came back and specialized in internal medicine, obtained FCP in medicine, was training at Medunsa. And after that, he went to the University of Pretoria, trained in cardiology, and obtained certification in cardiology there. That's my Isa. And it gives me great pleasure to allow today Dr. Maya Issa to take us through managing hypertension comprehensively. Over to you. Morning, morning. Yeah, uh, we're just waiting for the presentation to load. And then we can we can get going. Uh, it is an honor to come and present in front of uh, you as an audience. Uh, I've been trained. Uh, what Prof. Mkla doesn't mention is that he is the one who trained me, and that he's the one who inspired me to go and do cardiology. And he was uh, never he never took it easy with me. So hopefully I will impress him today. And then uh, yeah, also the presentation is now up. So uh, we're going to be talking about uh, hypertension, that comprehensive management. Uh, I thought uh, 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 when I try to work on the topic, I try and see what is the best way I can easily understand this thing. Then uh, I came up with this one, which is says, I looked at that old, old Western movie, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So now that separates three people you know, into three different categories. So I just structured my hypertension into that, the well, the sick and the dying, so that at least we can be able to have a much more uh, thorough look at hypertension. So, okay, so there's no conflict of interest. And then I was just explaining that Prof. Mpe, Prof. Mpla, uh, he held my hand. Oh, sorry. I'm not sure why it's going back. All right, yeah, so there's a quote from this guy who said, the truth is scary, the truth has bad breath at times, you know, it's from Dios. So I don't know why, where he was to him to, to come to that conclusion. So that is what we're trying to do. We're trying to unmask hypertension. So this is the state of hypertension, all right? So we're going to unmask some truth. You might smell, catch a bad breath there. So one billion people in the world have hypertension. So that's a lot of hypertension walking around, all right? So now here it is, the sick truth. You remember we've got the well, the sick and the dying. So the sick truth about hypertension. So half of that billion, they are unaware the hypertension. So that is half a billion people don't know. They are, they are not aware they're hypertensive and they are. And then of those who are treating with hypertension, half of them are not controlled. So basically we are giving them drugs, but they're not really helping them to achieve what we're trying to achieve, what we'll be discussing here. So which means 75% of the hypertension, we think that of the 50% that are not aware and the 25% that are uncontrolled. So that's a total of 75% of hypertension that are uncontrolled. So that is a huge number of people. So hopefully we tend to get to do better with managing the hypertension. 
So the normal blood pressure, as we know, is 120, less than 120 over 80. And hypertension is more than 140 over 90. For South African purposes, this tends to work for us, not the lower, low, lower readings for, as a threshold for treatment. I think I'm well, but in reality, I am sick. This is what a hypertension patient goes through, all right? They come to you, the work told them to go, to go for checkup because it's annual checkup. You tell them they're hypertensive, but they say I'm healthy, you know? The worst part is when they say I'm the healthiest person that I know. So this is hypertension. So one thing because of that, it is called the silent killer. Plato says the worst of all deception is self-deception. So this patient is going around uh, with this disease, but they tell themselves that they're well. All right. So this is the example that I normally teach when I do public talks about the gentleman who felt he was okay. His friends were all going to all sorts of specialists, doctors and whatever, have all sorts of medications and stuff. He took nothing. And then one day he was just going home and then he just collapsed and died. So he thought he was well all along while there was a storm that was growing. So this is what we're talking about. So in this formula here, that's what we normally work with as in cardiology. This is, this is what we do, all right? That the blood pressure is a product of cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. In one way or the other, we are manipulating one of those three things when we're treating a cardiology patient, all right? Okay, what's important also the management as well has to do with those three elements. All right, when we're managing by hypertension, it's either we're reducing the cardiac output or we are reducing the, 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 the systemic vascular resistance. And that's why we need multiple drugs. So when you get to management, we're going to be touching, touching a little bit on that. So this is uh, what happens with the vessels. It is similar to the balloon that there is pressure that is continuously being exerted on the wall of the, of the vessel. At some point, that balloon is gonna pop. That's what happened with our blood vessels in hypertension. So the measurement of blood pressure. It's normally done in the upper arm. Uh, the way it should be done, ideally it should be relaxed. All right, in a relaxed environment, the patient should be, have done everything to calm down. You know? Not cigarette smoking, taking coffees and none of those things. And then it should be like relaxed type of blood pressure. The one that we say, this one really worries us, we need to treat, all right. And then they must be in the seated position. They take the arm, they put it on the, on the table, nicely supported. Then we need to use the validated machine the cuff, the BP cuff, it should cover about 75% to 100% of the arm circumference, all right? If it's too big, it's going to underestimate. If it's too small, it's going to overestimate. So that is what is a, a we just need to be careful that we've got enough this thing. Normally, if you've got a, a, a adult practice, you have different circumferences of the arms, all right? Yeah, there's still a bit of entertainment. Oh, it's gone. <laughs> We've got different arm circumferences from the smallest to the largest. So you need uh, those different calf sizes. So you need the media and normal calf and the large calf for the larger patients so that you can get an accurate rhythm. I've got a question. I know you just have breakfast, I apologize, but one measurement of blood pressure is enough, true or false. I don't have one through. This crowd is sharp. <laughs> of course, we don't, we don't need one, one measurement of blood pressure. Normally, uh, in this uh, International Society of Hypertension, they recommend about two to three visits in one to four weeks, and then you get consistently high blood pressure then for you to be able to conclude that it's high. The other times is when we'll go to these patients. When you've got a patient who's already got complication of hypertension, then you start treating immediately. You don't need to come back in three weeks, come back in whatever and, and, and those things. But in under normal patients that you just pick up blood pressure, uh, you, need to, you need more than one reading on different settings, all right. 
It doesn't matter which side you measure blood pressure, as long as the blood pressure is accurate. True or false? In that picture, you have a blood pressure on the upper arm, you've got blood pressure on the foot, you've got blood pressure on the thigh, you've got blood pressure anywhere they can get. It doesn't matter where you get it, as long as you get it. true or false. Yeah, I've got a true at least this time. You know, somebody just wants to get the number. That's my guy, but it's false. All right. That is false. You need to avoid measuring in, on, on the wrist. This picture explains why. You know, what we're trying to do, we're trying to get the blood pressure on the here. Yeah, we're trying to get the blood pressure here on this area here around the heart. That's the blood pressure that we're trying to measure. In cardiology, we do take the patient to theater and then we can measure that directly. But because we can't take everybody there, we have to measure at least, at least when you're in the arm, you're closer to there. So you get the blood pressure that is closer to what is happening in the uh, iota, what's happening in the heart, as opposed to when you come and measure far down here. And if the patient has already got vascular complications, the blood vessels are blocked and so on, then you get even less accurate readings. So upper arm, that's where we measure the blood pressure. So this is the bit of a dramatic picture of a lady who's quite shocked that, why are you doing stuff to me? I came here, I've got a burning urine, you want me to, to, to give you my arm for blood pressure, why? You know? But this is the stuff that you all know, that whenever we see a patient, we take an opportunity, we take it as an opportunity to measure the blood pressure. All right, so this is the stuff, at least it's, it's what you do. A man is known by the company he keeps. We are in agreement that if you show me your friends, I'll show you who you are. You know, yes. If all your friends are in jail, I can assume you're a criminal. <laughs> all right. So, so, so that's the same. That is the same goes with with with, with hypertension. You know, I, I I normally get to the point where I want to get a little bit off ramp a little bit. When I'm asked talk about the hypertension, I like I want to off ramp a little bit because. It's not hypertension, it's the cardiovascular complications, if you get me. So now, the other conditions that, that, that tend to cause that is what we call risk factors. Of course, increasing age, genetic factors, and, and the, you, these are non-modifiable. There's nothing much you can do about that, all right? And then this part here is what is much more of a biggest interest to me, to you, your cholesterol, cigarette smoking, diabetes. These are very, very modifiable, but these are the ones which are gonna give us much more accelerated complications. They're gonna give us much more worse form of complications. So when we treat our hypertensives, we need to always, at least once a year or twice if, if, if there's something wrong, check this thing, the cholesterol, the diabetes and stuff. If they are private patients, there's uh, this chronic packages, all right, for prescribed minimum benefits, these tests are covered. So if we can do this on a regular, just to make sure that we are tracking this together with the hypertension, we are doing much, much better in controlling the cardiovascular complications of that patient. All right, uh, on this other side, it's just the additional risk factors, your obesity, your stressful lifestyle, lack of exercise and so on. All right, so this one explains what I said, but a little bit more complex. All right, so yeah, I apologize for the complicated graphs. I normally don't like them myself, but it's a very, very important uh, concept of cardiovascular continuum. So what we do, we are starting here. All right, with this respect to what you're talking about, hypertension, your cholesterol, diabetes, insulin resistance, smoking, all these things, all right. And then what it does, it starts causing Damage to the heart, you get hypertrophy, it causes damage to the, to the arteries, coronary arteries, and then you end up getting your anginas, and then you can get myocardial infarctions, which can cause arrhythmias that can cause death. You get muscle uh, disease, which can end up causing heart failure at the end. You get a patient who come with heart failure. Unfortunately, as a cardiologist, these are the people who come and land with us. So what you are trying to do, or with this comprehensive management is to try and push back, go anti-clockwise on this so that we don't have the patients coming here. We prevent them from getting there. We catch them early. We stop them from getting in. That's what we're trying to do. So this is just showing the progress of atherosclerosis from 
early plaque and then grows until there's thrombosis and then there's complete blockage. This just the, 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 the explanation of the essential hypertension, which is what we're gonna treat most of the time. So it has a genetic factors, it's got environmental factors, and then the renal, renal structure. So this interplay of these factors, that's what creates a, is a, a essential hypertension. What is important is normally we try to treat, intervene on different mechanisms. Management is comprehensive. We treat inter, a different, inter, a, we intervene on different points in treating hyper, hypertension. Okay, so this is the, 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 the secondary complications. Majority of them will be renal and endocrine. All right, so those are gonna be the majority of the secondary causes of hypertension. So we need to treat early because it is a silent killer. That's what we've been emphasizing. And then we need to look beyond the obvious. All right. Don't ask them to stick the arm. We measure, we give them a pill and say, go home. So we need to look at the company that hypertension keeps all the time. All right. So the complications, mainly they are vascular and then they are heart disease. So it's cardiovascular complications. Those are the complications of hypertension and that's what we need to be looking out for. So in the heart, all right, we, we've got to say we're dealing with the well, the sick and the dying. All right, so that's how we're also gonna look at the complications. There's the well. The patient who comes to you, they've got hypertension, they insist they don't need drugs because that blood pressure is not a problem, you are exaggerating. Has anybody ever come across that patient? Oh, yes, <laughs> I'm not the only one. <laughs> yes, we do have patients who are told, they go to the first doctor, the first doctor says the blood pressure is high, they go to the second one, they say the blood pressure is high. For whatever reason, somebody refers to the cardiologist, when you tell them you've got hypertension, they say, no, 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 please leave that one alone. Leave it alone, I'm not. So now we do, we do come across that patient. But what is important is they can have left ventricular hypertrophy and this can be uh, asymptomatic. They don't feel anything, but there's something going wrong with their heart. And that needs to be treated and needs to be treated urgently and needs to be controlled. So this is the ECG. All right, uh, we've got a Sokolo Leon criteria. I normally prefer things to be a little bit easier. All right, when we look at V5, V6, when the, the tall R waves and V1, when we measure the product of that, if it's more than 35 millimeters, it is. There are other criteria for a, a left ventricular hypertrophy that we use in cardiology. And then if you cannot interpret this, do an ECG, give to the patient, refer them to a specialist. That is still good enough, all right. So at least what it does, this in cardiology, we normally get a little bit emotional when you see the ECG you know, because you have caught the snapshot of the heart in that particular moment. If something changes in a month time, something changes in six months time, in a year's time, we've got that one as a reference. All right, so we normally like when, when people do this, if you do, you're not sure, you come, you send to us, I've got this ECG, please have a look at, look at it for me or something. But this patient, I normally don't have symptoms and that normally is the concern, all right. And then you've got the sick, the patient who start now having angina and start having those things. We must always remember the company hypertension keeps. If the patient is of advanced age, the patient is diabetic, the patient is has high cholesterol, is a smoker and all those things, then it's telling you that you need to, to really, really be much more aggressive in referring the patient and treating the patient and so on, because that patient normally is the one who's likely to, to run into trouble. All right, then, the dying, normally these are the heart failures, the end stage patients and stuff. Normally there's a lot of treatments and interventions that we do for this patient, but to be honest, it's all, always too little too late. All right, so if you can catch them a little bit earlier in the earlier stages, control the hypertension, we prevent them from getting there. It's not a good thing for me to say as a cardiologist because this is our bread and butter. But if we treat them well, hey, patients benefit. All right, so there's heart failure when they've got the dyspneic and then they've got edema. The next target, the brain. All right, we're gonna go through our, the well. 
All right. So these are the patients. When they start to get changes in the retina, they got retinopathy and so on, they normally feeling nothing at that stage. All right. Especially if they're diabetic. What I normally do with diabetics that come to my practice, I always ask about the eyes. They always minimize, yeah, there are times I've got a bit of something, but uh, it's not something serious. I can see very well. I don't use glasses, you know, but once there's a, a bit of a clue, then you normally send them to an ophthalmologist to have a look at that eye, you know. And then the sick is the patient who come with transient ischemic attacks. These are the most difficult, you know, because now I was feeling something, but now I'm fine, you know. Then you don't know whether the patient is being dramatic or whether they, whether it's the truth. These are the patients that need to be treated quite aggressively because the treatment can prevent them getting, developing an evolved stroke. Some of them at times, they got a stroke with a neuro, with a motor features, the motor features resolve and then they've got some subclinical features. You know, they've got a bit of numbness, they've got a bit of, we find that the stroke is actually there. So if we get the patients with this, uh, transient weakness, transient numbness, and those type of things, and then they happen to be hypertensive, let's treat them quite aggressively, all right? They might end up having a disaster in our hand. Uh, the dying, all right, and they come with strokes. I use a, a neurologist who used to be quite pragmatic, all right? He says, no, this is a completed event. Whatever we do, we can try and rehabilitate the patient, but we can't tell them we'll get, give, get the patient the brain back. All right, so that's the reality. What we don't want, we don't want to get here. All right, this is the patient who had a big infarct on the CT scan, this dark portion here, that's the area of infarction and edema. The kidney. All right, so the patient, uh, early on, the patient will have protein urine. All right, so we do dipsticks. We send the urine for microalbumin. We try and check if the kidneys are starting to get damaged before the patient has any symptoms. And if those things are there, we start to be a bit aggressive because we're pre preventing them from getting to later, later stages. Most of the chronic kidney diseases, there's a five stages of chronic kidney diseases. Normally the first four, the patient is feeling nothing while the kidney is being damaged. So we get that a lot. They don't not keep you when you send them to a nephrologist and so because they feel nothing, but the kidney is going. All right, so we just need to be careful and we need to always for our patients monitor the kidney function. All right, at least at baseline, the minimum that I do is to do a creatinine on hypertensives. You do a serum creatinine, then you get the GFR as well, then you can monitor that what is going on. And then the, the dye, these are the patients on dialysis. So normally there's not much, either the patient is a transplant or Hopefully, hopefully it's a reversible condition that the patient is going to go. But if it's hypertensives, normally this is the stage we don't want to reach. The peripheral artery disease, all right. The well, the patient has something, you palpate the pulses, you don't feel a certain pulse or something like that, but they're feeling nothing. And then the sick, they've got intermittent claudication. I walk a small distance, I feel a bit of pain, cramps. When I stop, I'm okay, all right. So that patient needs to be referred treated aggressively. The dying is the gangrene. This is not the patients we want to see because traditionally, spiritually, patients don't want to lose a leg. So we normally have a lot of wars with this gangrene type of situation. So hopefully we prevent them from getting here. Yeah. 